is there. I can identify with that woman. That power really pulled me to law. And I learned law as law is. I joined law school in 1984 and studied law in a very sanitized, powerful form. I took my clinical program at a court, uh, very not, not actually uh, critical at all, did my pupillage at Kaplan and Stratton under the best lawyers and just did law. And I was still enthused with the power of law. That was until I met Professor Ayash Guy at uh, the University of Warwick uh, in the program on law in development. And every time he kept saying that law doesn't operate in a vacuum. And then I went to Zimbabwe, and that's where I met uh, Dr. Lillian Tibatemwa, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Makerere. And there again we were studying, I was also with a colleague, Jerry Karuru, who is here, women's law, feminism, and then I started studying environmental law, which Professor Okidi interested me in. And at that point, I began to develop a disquiet about law. And basically, it was the death of the innocence. The law is, didn't work for me anymore. So why the fallacies? Uh, after looking at feminism, looking at environmental law, and looking at international relations, I began to see these mirage or paradox of rights. Are uh, really all men equal? When we say uh, all men are equal, are they? Are uh, all human beings equal? And just immediately as I'd say it, I'd ask, are they really equal? And are all states equal? And that is when I began to think about equality, inequality, discrimination, non-discrimination, inclusion, and exclusion. I found them operating as a strange bedfellows, appearing as one and at the same time, and then contradicting each other. So rights as the anchor of equality and discrimination for me was putting out what uh, is, I call a chiasmus, that it gives on one hand, takes with the other. The ambiguities, the fluidity, the dynamism. And that's when the light bulb came from uh, Warwick. Uh, context is everything. It does matter. It colors the rights of subjects. And it also colors the discourses about uh, subjects. So I began to see how knowledge, production, legitimation, and dissemination impacts on discourses about subjects of rights. And then I began now looking at it here. You can see on the one side, women, men, and basically, again, lived realities of women, lived realities of men, and all men are equal, men meaning men and women, and there is actually a problem right there. So fast forward to we, we talked about this. I see very many gallant soldiers in the women's movement. Professor Wajiko Kabira, Professor Maria Nzomo. Uh, the fight for a new constitution in which at Article 27, we have a very, and of course, Yash Pal Guy, who was the chair of CKRC, a very robust exposition of the right to equality. But again, I began to see that the equality paradox began to appear even before the ink of the Constitution had dried. Even before the, uh, President Kibaki had put down the Constitution, there were contests about equality. So I began again to look at the whole question of what are rights. People that have tried to explain the conception of rights, the question of human rights, critiquing rights and then equality discrimination. Uh, I found Wesley Hoffeld's uh, attempt to explain rights very useful for me because in looking at equality, non-discrimination, inclusion, exclusion, I, was, I, I began, of course, like all lawyers, to look at who has right, what right, how to access and enforce the right. And looking at the context, it seemed like this was really a maze. And it was uh, useful for me to look at the dual correlatives and opposites that Wesley Hoffeld in 1919 expounded on when he was saying, okay, a person has a right, somebody else has a duty. A, a person has uh, power, it puts another one under a liability. 
If there is a privilege, then nobody has a right against you. If there is immunity, then uh, others are disabled from uh, implementing law against you. And then, of course, the opposite, the right, no right, power, disability, privilege, duty, and immunity, liability. But again, uh, even looking at those, uh, still starting from the law, law, and looking at the context in which I lived, and this is a plural legal context, where you're talking about international law, you're talking about national law, then you're talking about customary law. And you know, customary law, for me, in my experience, most times comes to tell you what you should not do. And therefore, you have uh, an absence of clarity of claims, expectations, in uh, the different normative orders. And where they intersect, you have subjects of law falling through the cracks. So you, you, we have then this whole body of uh, international human rights uh, instruments, the Declaration on human, uh, of Human Rights, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and basically, there is no quarrel. All of them are saying there is equality. And national constitutions follow and say that we have uh, equality. But even in there, we begin to see uh, chiasmas. And basically, this is because people aren't starting from the original position. And uh, basically, the critiques of rights are the ones that help us see why is there that contradiction. And uh, I, I like um, Professor Bakshi's uh, discussion of how, even though we have human rights, uh, the human rights are there, but there is justified slavery, colonization, subjugation. Why is it that indigenous populations are still fighting for their rights if we have equality and it is in those instruments? Why is it that women and children have to agitate for their rights and then the poor and marginalized? And if you look at our constitution, as we will see, all these things continue to trouble us. And again, you're seeing human rights being ridden with hierarchies and asymmetries. You see contradictions, disputations, rivalries, instabilities, and these are influenced by power relations. And I liked uh, Bentham's anarchical fallacies. If you look at page six, you will see the quote he has there wh when he's saying, all men are equal, absolute nonsense. And he compares different men who can't be equal. But my absolute favorite actually is the feminist critique of rights in The Man of Law by Nafin Gaire. And Nafin, uh, in looking at who the man of law is, the, the reason the man of law is important for me is because when I started studying law, remember the allure of power of law? I, I, law is. But then uh, this sort of brings a damper because it is telling me that the law of, I mean, the man of law is a man, not a woman. That, of course, means that I am not the man of law. This is a successful middle class man, not a working class male. And it is not all males, actually. It is males who demonstrate a form of emphasized middle class masculinity. So if you are a poor man, then man of law you are not. And uh, essentially, of course, I don't want to unpack which men would be of law, but uh, the, the, I, I doubt that many of us here are men of law. So I am not alone. Then I, I went into uh, environmental studies. Again, ecocentric critiques of rights. Uh, discussions on, uh, we are talking about rights, uh, and we are talking about environmental rights. Are environmental rights for the resources themselves, or are they for us to enjoy the resources? And I, I came across an article by Christopher Stone when he was asking, should trees have standing? Many of my students probably thought I was mad when I was telling them, analyze, should trees have standing? And they probably were thinking, this uh, Dr. Mbote has lost it. Then looking at property rights, again, I look at they include the owner, they exclude the non-owner. You have conflicting interpretations of property rights. Sometimes they free you or emancipate you. At other times, they actually uh, oppress you. 
but they do this in the same vein. So where does equality fit in all this? Because we are saying that rights are predicated on the dignity and worth of legal subjects. So we all ought to be men of law. If we are talking about equality of rights, opportunities, participation in political, economic, social, and cultural development, and then benefiting from the results. As lawyers, our cardinal issue is that we want justice, and justice demands formal equality. But from my study of international environmental law and also feminism and property rights, I began to see that this is very elusive at both individual and international levels because economic inequalities between individuals and states uh, and the historical and social relations between them do color that. So you may have de jure equality or equality by law, but then you have uh, de facto discrimination, discrimination in fact because when you have adoption of laws for equal treatment of legal subjects without taking into account the differences, the assumption that we all start from the same point, then you're going to privilege some, some and also uh, uh, you will disadvantage others. So basically, you're not going to have equality of rights and opportunities if there are resource and opportunity disparities. For instance, in the context of apartheid, does it make sense to say we all have the same rights? There is need for more than just the enunciation. Or where people are slaves, or where you have colonized nations, or where you have men and women. And it is actually my expectation that when we talk about gender, we are not just talking about uh, women, because we don't want women to now be the, 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 the men to be the oppressed. We want to ensure that whatever uh, steps we take actually ensure everybody has uh, the same rights. And uh, the, the, what I like uh, about Aristotle's, um, Aristotle's enunciation here is, he says, if they are not equal, uh, they will not be equal. If you give an equals equal shares, or you give equals and equal shares, you still create inequality. And th that discussion is, is in the inaugural uh, th that you have. So what, given that uh, formal equality is not getting us there, we go to substantive equality, where we want to have what, again called equity, to complement formal equality. And what formal equality does, uh, what uh, substantive equality does, is again to go back to what is the role of law. Law should bring in stability, coherence, foreseeability in human relations. If formal equality isn't bringing that, then we need to bring in other measures so that we have fair, fairness in the treatment of legal subjects. And basically, uh, equity or substantive equality recognizes the possibility of inequality in opportunities, wealth, natural endowments, and therefore uh, necessitates differential treatment of legal uh, subjects. And this uh, differential treatment is found both in international and national way, I mean in national law, as a way of implementing uh, principles of distributive justice. Discrimination uh, complements uh, equality and equity. And dis discrimination means making distinction, but has come to mean more non-permitted distinction. And uh, we are saying non-permitted distinction because there are certain distinctions that are permitted, as we will see. I like two definitions of discrimination. The one in the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which talks about distinctions, exclusions based on race, color, descent, national, or ethnic origin. And the one in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CIDO, which brings in the question of discrimination on the basis of sex. Uh, basically, when you look at uh, discrimination then, there's going to be, in law, direct discrimination as uh, where a law provides uh, discrimination for certain subjects or indirect, where it is not anticipated, but in the application of the law, you actually have discrimination.
So differential treatment then comes in as permitted discrimination to level the playing field. This is what most people would call affirmative action, and we do have it in our constitution at Article 56, for instance, when it talks about affirmative action for minorities and marginalized. But then, even as we say that, I ask myself, who is minor? Who is margina marginalized? What are the indices of minority and marginality? When, are we talking about countries, regions, communities, individuals? And uh, for how long, if we decide we want to have differential treatment measures, should those be implemented? So you then come uh, from, from those questions, I come into the next issue of intersectionality. It is rarely the case that one is the subject of one discrimination. Uh, basically, intersectionality or multiple exclusion is looking at the wholeness of the legal subject. And you're looking at subjects that are marginalized in more ways than one. And here, you're looking at the fact that one identity can e encapsulate many intersections. You're also looking at the fact that marginalizers are not always the usual suspects. Like when we talk about gender inequality, people are looking, if it is men that are discriminated against, they are looking at women. But it is not always the, that way. If you look at the men of law and you begin to see the varieties of, uh, or the gradation of different categories of subjects, you will see it's not di as direct. Again, marginalization is dynamic and changes. So you may be marginalized and you move marginally into the majority, but then something else happens, like things like maybe famine, and you move back to, to the marginalized category. So you, you really won't capture subjects of law if you just look at uh, the mar one marginalization. And then also, marginalizations intersect. So you may have what is called the matrix of domination, that everything, I remember one time somebody saying, asking me, I think it was Professor Okodo Kombo, do you think that law, custom, religion, all of them conspired to oppress women? And you see, basically, I, I had no answer to that question. But the, it explains the matrix of uh, domination. Our constitution has the non-permitted distinctions, race, sex, I think a, an extremely robust exposition. Race, sex, pregnancy, marital status, health status, ethnic, social origin, color, age, disability, religion, conscience. And right there, you begin to see the multiple uh, intersections and you can actually have a matrix of uh, domination, even where you are born. Uh, where you are born, whether you are married, whether you're pregnant, what race you are, they can all, or what ethnic group you are, they can all actually come into one. And we've actually seen our courts uh, canvas this issue. And I found the discussion in, uh, it was the discussion on the appointments to the Supreme Court. If you look at this uh, quote, where the judges are actually talking about a lady judge, that, that is gender, from central western Nyanza Rift Valley, that is a region, they are talking about tougher and more difficult conditions. That is the context in which they find themselves. And then Turkana, Pokot, Masai, Boran, Kuria, those may be ethnic communities, they may also be region. And then, basically what uh, the judges were saying is we shouldn't privilege one exclusion. Yet, if you look at all those exclusions, in there, there will be gender. So basically, again, the need to look at uh, the multiple. Uh, and, and for me, again, going back to the allure of law and to my disclaimer that this is also subjective, I'm looking at the crisis of identity that one has when you're looking at this issue, because I can see myself in all those women. And you may not believe it, but I do actually see myself. And, and my mother would actually attest to the fact that I see myself in all of those women. So why do we abhor inequalities? I mean, why worry about inequalities if there is this chiasmus? I mean, is it because uh, equality is right and should be the guiding principle of conduct, uh, and also because it benefits most of us? Or do we do it because 
It is the right thing to do. It is a primary truth, a principle of ethics, and we don't need to give reasons for it. And, and this is the whole discussion about utilitarianism and intuitionism. And uh, actually, law in providing for subjects of law worries about these issues when it's talking about the basis for inclusion and exclusion. And uh, you will see the utilitarians talking about balance in society. So people like Wellesley Hoffeld, when they are talking about the correlatives and opposites, will be looking at uh, how these balance out. But then there are those who argue for intuitionism. And they are saying, we look at the holistic view of human dignity. So equality applies on account of people being persons independent of any purposes or criteria. They have, uh, th we are all created by one creator. We are in the image of God. So there is no room for tolerating outright discrimination and differ differentiation based on privilege and disadvantage. And actually, uh, as a lawyer, I have struggled when people begin talking about who should have rights and who shouldn't have rights, when we are looking at uh, this holistic view of the individual. And uh, there is uh, an article I really liked. Fletcher talks about this uh, very, very um, animatedly. So what are the fallacies? Uh, basically, from all that I have said, you see inherent incongruences which vitiate equality articulation with respect to situations and subjects of law. Because the assumption of sameness is fallacious. No two people are the same. They are, even in here, we may say all of us are equal. Some of us are tall, others are short, some of us are a little uh, well endowed, others not too well endowed. So no two persons are alike. So when you talk about like treatment, and you see there, there is literature actually which says tall people are favored, good looking people are favored. If you're a short person, people don't see you. So that, that sameness, and, uh, sameness and difference principle. Uh, of course, if you, have, you are a short person, you need to have a loud voice. So <laughs> states, uh, you look at states in international law, they talk about sovereign equality. They are no baby states. But you see, when we begin to talk about, but we were colonized, so we need to be treated differently. They are rich and poor states. They are old and new states. And I give the example in the lecture of, can we say uh, Sudan and South Sudan are equal? Of course, they are equal. We can't say they are not equal. But there are certain practicalities that nuance that equality. Then I look at differential treatment in international environmental law. In, in the area of uh, biodiversity, where many countries in the developing part of the world have a lot of resources, uh, the, 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 the countries, the, the world community felt that they needed to enable them to implement provisions on international environmental law. And it's the same with climate change, because climate change affects all of us, but we all need to deal with it uh, together. So you will have uh, rich countries agreeing developing ones actually get te uh, technological assistance and even finances. Then I look at the Nile, again, the, looking at the position of the upper and lower riparian countries and agreements on the use of the Nile waters entered into when many of the upper riparian countries were actually colonies. And then gender, the issue of the two-thirds rule in elective and appointive positions. And here, what you see is the resistance by guardians of bastions of patriarchy and the allied citadels of male political privilege who actually have gone home as of last week. So uh, when we begin to talk about, uh, is it really progressive implementation? You see, uh, gender inequality is so deep-rooted that if we talk about progressive implementation, we need to, na to actually name the steps that we need to take. And if you look again at the case on uh, the appointments to the Supreme Court, you will see that the judges again said that uh, those who are arguing for gender equality needed to keep their feminine missiles to their launch pads until the state acts 
on policies and programs, legis the legislator uh, legislates, and there are standards. And basically, they also said that provisions do not offend merely because they are not made with mathematical niceties or because they result in inequality. And I ask, why have equality and non-discrimination if inequality is going to be so blatantly justified? And will our rights lie in limbo at the pleasure of legislators and the state? How do we ensure that new claimants for rights are accepted by those already having the rights because they act as gatekeepers? And basically, we'll put up uh, obstacles in the way of those who want to share their privileges. Then in the area of employment, uh, again, uh, I see gallant warriors here. When I started working in the University of Nairobi, married women were not entitled to house allowance. And uh, when, if you took uh, maternity leave, you lost annual leave. And I actually do have letters telling me we have noted that you got married. I will not name... <laughs> I will not name the officer because he was at my wedding at the invitation of my father. And he was telling me that I needed to repay the money I had gotten as house allowance. Thankfully, all this has changed. So we have now admittance of women, and it was none other than Maria Nzomo who broached this issue at uh, the senior common room with the former president, Daniel Arap Moy, and we began to get housing allowance and uh, the, 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 the maternity leave uh, didn't come until we got new labor laws. But I wonder, now we are equal. I know what it